What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Calcio Review. I'm Alberto, and I'm joined tonight by my friend Nick. Nick, how are you doing? Doing well, brother. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, yeah, man. We're going to have some fun today, and Nick's going to uh, have the pleasure of representing two teams, all right? You're going out there on social media, repping Bologna pretty hard, but he is a Lazio fan, so... Uh, <laughs> You know, Lazio probably uh, picking things up after what happened last weekend, making you a little more happy in uh, Champions League. All right. No, no question. It's uh, the, the tale of two Lazios, as it has been for three years under Sadi, and it's uh, it's a huge frustration. I, I mean, I'm I'm turning into the the Juve fans that I hate on Twitter, the ones that are so anti Allegri that it like masks the fact that they're actually fans of the club, I feel like I have to catch myself now because I'm doing the same thing with Sadi, but it, it's the same story, man. For three years, we have a manager who cannot get this team motivated to play the bottom five sides in the league. I mean, it's inexcusable to lose to a winless team, you know, not even drop points, but to have a one goal lead, to give up two goals, to give Salernitana their first win. They're, there can't be a, a reason for that. Like not in year three, not in week 13. Uh, I, I just don't have it. So exceptionally frustrated in the league so far this year. Yeah, we are going to get to it. That is the first game we have on the docket to kind of break into. But first, I just want everyone to know, you know, what you're all about, where you're from. Obviously, Kicks and Picks podcast, which is great. So uh, I'll give you this little moment to just kind of, you know, plug yourself, let everyone know where you're at. And then uh, we'll get right into it with Lazio Salernitana, with Salernitana yeah. obviously grabbing that victory. Sorry, I didn't mean to, to spoil the occasion there. All good, all good. Yeah, I appreciate it. So as you mentioned, Kicks and Picks podcast at Kicks Picks Pod on Twitter. Uh, myself, Steve, Scott, we break down all the key matches in Serie A in the Premier League, uh, any any other big matches around Europe. So um, same same type of vibe. You've been on the show. You know, we had the pleasure and, uh, you know, we, we try to have fun for a half hour and then we give out some gambling picks. So if you guys are into betting, I know, um, you know, it's, it's becoming big here in North America over the past couple of years. So the three of us really enjoy that. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to look at every matchup through that lens, right. Give a little bit of a, a betting angle. So if anybody is new to that is seasoned, uh, would, would certainly love a, a listen or a follow, uh, or, you know, love to interact, happy to answer any questions to any newbies, but we've had some fun. I think we've doing it, been doing it for about two years now. Um, we've, we've been winning money, so that's always good. Uh, but you know, we, we definitely, none of us are professionals, right? This is a hobby for us. So, uh, entertainment first gambling second um but it, so far so good so appreciate there you that go. Uh, we are going to give our predictions going into uh week 14 all right round 14 okay. so uh you'll have, have a chance to, to uh, back up some of your picks there and i always let everybody know uh gamble at your own risk and uh fajoli you just stay out of it all together all right my man uh you got uh, making up to do there buddy now Lazio Salernitana. So uh, on last week's show, I did actually pick Salernitana to get the W here. I just see a Lazio that is not uh, typical of a Saudi squad as far as like offense goes. I mean, I don't think they've made up for some of the losses that they've taken. And I just, uh, I don't have confidence in them they were going uh on the road as well and no luis alberto i just thought if inzaghi's men were gonna get a w that would probably the one uh be the one and uh yeah that's the way it uh it played out uh candreva uh had to be um obviously and uh getting a, a screamer there that a lot were picking for a goal of the week but i was like i don't know if i give it goal of the week i definitely don't give it goal of the weekend people were maybe hyping it a little much uh, I think maybe Keeper could have done a little bit better yes. on the read. Absolutely. But now I'll let you actually go into your thoughts on Lazio. And then we will also talk about the European matchup that they face this week as well. But start off with Salernitana for us. Yeah, I think um, there's not much more for me to say because you hit the nail on the head, right? It's uh, They haven't week 13 in year three. We haven't seen this this Saudi magic that we've been promised consistently, right? We saw it 
a little bit last year. I think they overperformed. They exceeded expectations, but we're not seeing it now. And um, Milinkovic Savic obviously left in the off season. That's, you know, we were never going to be able to replace him. Anybody that thought we were, I think was sadly mistaken. Um, that's, that's taken a toll. And the guys that we've brought in, I, I think we've made some smart buys, some guys that people had, I think, reason to be excited about. Uh, Rovella from Juve, you know, I was, I was pretty pumped about him. Kamada, um, Isaacson, Isaacson, I don't know how you, we pronounce his name correctly. So uh, Castellanos as well. He, he had a good year in Spain last year. So depth looked like it was being addressed. But all the players who performed well in year one, year two of Saudi really have not done that yet in year three. And Luis Alberto, you hit the nail on the head, right? He was absolutely been our best player so far this year. Him missing, uh, you know, you would think against Salernitana shouldn't be that big of a deal, but turns out that's exactly what we were missing in this game. And the midfield hasn't really come together. And I think this four three three. Uh, I'm if anybody follows me on Twitter or talks to me about football ever, I, I'm such a hater of the four three three. I think it is impossibly easy to defend, especially if you don't have really creative, really skilled players on the ball. And you can make a case, but you know Lazio doesn't have the quality that's needed to run that formation the way Sadi wants to run it. Yeah. What would you like to see them do? In a perfect world, I, I like like a four, two, three, one. Um, it, it's tough, man, because you know Chido's getting a little bit older. I mean, we, we saw. I know we'll get into it. We saw midweek. You know, he can still deliver the goods when he gets the service and when he's well rested and healthy. Um, but his healthy, well rested days are probably behind him at this point. So, I think it's going to need to be a, a complete revamp of the offense, whether that's with Saudi or that's with somebody else. Um, You know, they have to hope to pick up their level, pick up their intensity, compete for a European spot. I think top four is probably wishful thinking if we're being honest, but fifth, sixth place are still within reach. Uh, We're very fortunate. I think everybody's a little bit inconsistent right outside of uh, Inter and Juve. I think they're clear, you know, one and two right now. So it's still all to play for, but you know, it, it just the, the consistency, the losing to bottom five sides, to not getting all three points to bottom ten sides. We've seen that for three years, and and that's my real frustration. Yeah, for sure. We are, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about like another thing is just in general, like 15 goals allowed, 14 goals for for Lazio. So it's a problem on both ends really and uh, you know a negative one goal difference i think this is one of the worst starts for lazio as far as points go through 13 rounds um there's a lot of work to be done and like you said it's not like Saudi just got there and i've been saying something about Saudi for quite some time and when we look back to that lazio squad that he, or sorry the napoli squad when he went lights out and whatnot uh, you know we are kind of seeing the same thing we saw in only one season at Juventus when he came to join because we saw flashes of kind of what his football could bring, but we never saw it consistently, yeah. okay? And you got to hold on a sec. Hold on. A wardrobe change. Yeah, war- wardrobe change because this autofocus on my camera is driving me nuts. But what I was saying was we were kind of in similar uh, feelings with Sadi with the year he was at Juventus because we saw flashes of what his football could bring, but we never actually saw it consistently. And to be honest, for us to get through, we had to crawl through that finish line. Yes, he had to deal with COVID and whatnot, but it really wasn't pretty football. And to be honest, I think it might even be a statement that's fair to say that maybe he caught lightning in a bottle at Napoli there, and we haven't really seen that sorry ball that, you know, took the world by storm at Napoli there and I, uh, that might be the case. Do you think that's an accurate statement? No, I, I absolutely agree. I think he had maybe some of the best, most consistent attackers that he's ever had. He had Jorginho in his prime. Uh, we could, you know, we could debate the merits of Jorginho probably for another hour, but um, you know, he, he made that team go and they had the ball an awful lot. And like you said, I, I think it was lightning in a bottle. We had a weaker Serie A. Let's yeah. just, be honest right they 
they looked better because the the Milan clubs weren't performing that well. The Rome clubs weren't performing that well. So, um, and, and you know how us Italians are, how we are in Serie A. We overvalue some of these Italian coaches sometimes. So um, I give him credit. He did go abroad, mixed results, but, you know, here he is. Yeah. He's back. Yeah. Well, didn't get a jo- the job done in uh, match day 13. However, in European play, they did uh, see themselves qualify in Champions League with a 2-0 victory over Celtic. So uh, quickly, your thoughts on that matchup and that game and how the Champions League campaign's going. Yeah, uh, listen, all the negative things I talked about, it, 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 he did a great job to erase everything with one performance, right? Yeah. I think, um, not that not that his job was actually on the line, but you, you know, he saved his job, right? At least in the eyes of critics. Um, so uh, mixed emotions, right? When the Champions League draw came out and you looked at it, you said, okay, tough group, but you know, if, if we're hopeful, Lazio can make it out of this group, right? They, you know, you have to take six points off of Celtic. If you can take care of business at home, you're probably making it out of the group. I probably undervalued Atletico Madrid and they've been fantastic, not only in Spain, but in that group. I mean, they're the, the class of the group. They have 15 goals in in five games. I mean, when did you ever in your lifetime see Atletico Madrid score three goals a game? So, um, I, I was actually undervaluing them. I think I overvalued Feyenoord, who, you know, they won the Dutch League last year. They're a quality team. They score a ton of goals. They took it to us the first game, but we were able to respond. That was really the turning point, and I think I have to give Saudi credit. He took it more seriously than I thought he would, um, you know, especially after the first couple of games, the comments started to come out there. Um, it, it was, you know, everything to play for. Things weren't going that well. Uh, he, he gave some guys playing time um, that, you know, I think haven't featured all that much. They looked pretty solid through the first half. They weren't able to break Celtic down, but he made the necessary adjustments and they got the result. And that's a team you have to beat. And it's a, a great response after losing to Salernitana. There you go. There you go. So, uh, yeah, we're going to get to uh, previewing uh, Lazio's game as obviously uh, this weekend they're going to be taking on uh, Cagliari and we'll get to that a little bit later. We are going to go through some of the other matches. Obviously, match day 13, we had Atalanta and Napoli. Mazzari's return and getting the job done 2-1 there. Um, I think he's going to keep it simple. And I think he's going to let them try and play uh, the same way they did last year and just get after it. And uh, I'm not ruling Napoli out uh, just yet. For me, Atalanta is not very convincing. Um, in my opinion, they're not scoring goals the way the Atalanta, you know, where we've become accustomed to over the last several years. But this game uh, was a win for uh, Napoli. And I thought it was going to be tight like that. Could have ended up a draw. But uh, hey, Napoli found a way to uh, get the job done. This is going to be a team that's still going to generate a lot of opportunities. And I feel like at any moment, once those guys hit their swag, Osaman's starting to slowly get back into it. They can cause some problems. I'm definitely not ruling them out of the race yet. And there's a big, big, juicy matchup this weekend with Inter at the Meradona. So your thoughts quickly on Atalanta and Napoli. Yeah, I'm going to echo what you said. I think um, I give them a lot of credit for getting rid of the Garcia, right? That's to admit that you made a mistake and to ch- still try to salvage the season, uh, whether Matsadi is the correct answer or not, that's up for debate. But the fact that they went out and made that move, I, I give them a lot of credit. And I think Matsadi is going to be good just from the standpoint of, you know, like you said, he's not going to rock the boat. They know that he's expendable. They don't expect him to stay maybe even beyond this year. Um, so from that standpoint, it's smart. You can start recruiting. You can really figure out who you want to take over this team long-term a uh, great win for them. You know, especially, you know, Osiman coming back is good. I'm a little worried about them long-term just because he will be missing time for the African cup of nations, him and Angisa. That's going to be, you know, pretty big holes to fill for, uh, yeah. for Napoli. And I think Cavada is about at 75% of what he was last year. I think part of that could be fatigue. Part of it is probably, they're starting to figure him out a little bit. So uh, they will have to cope with that. Yep. And I think without Atalanta, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's the same story. You know, they, they had years where I think they were fortunate. Some other clubs weren't as good. They're just the hot and cold team of Serie A. They 
win games that you don't expect them to win. They lose games you don't expect them to lose. Um, Lookman has been a disappointment for me. I thought he had a fantastic year last year. He hasn't built upon that. He's got off to a slow start. Another guy who will be playing for Nigeria, so he's going to miss some time. And Skamaka is not my favorite. Uh, I mean, I, I think he's a good signing for them. He's a good player. He'll probably grow into the team, grow into the role, but uh, he gets a lot more hype than the results that he's produced to this point in his career. So yeah. he's had some good performances. Yeah, you know, he's he's doing okay, but is he going to carry that team and propel them to a top six finish? I don't know. It's awfully tight, uh, I will say that. I mean, when you start looking at 5th to uh, even 10th, uh, 11th and whatnot, uh, Lazio on 11th at 17 points, but 5th uh, and 6th at 21 points. Everyone else in between, Frosinone, Monza, Fiorentina, Atalanta, Bologna's just on a crazy run, uh, had their streak snapped uh, two weeks ago. But, uh, yeah, and Roma, you know, Roma's... Uh, a lot of teams, I feel, can fit the bill of what we just explained for Atalanta. And I think it's going to be one hell of a battle for those European places. And uh, you might have a team in the top four right now that uh, could easily slide out if they don't sort things out. And that's Milan. But uh, real quick, we will uh, talk about Atalanta as they uh, drew Sporting 1-1 today in Europa League. That sees them actually get the top spot. Yep. Okay, um, and then uh, Napoli faced Madrid in Champions League, losing 4-2, but actually putting up a, a good showing for the majority of that game, to be honest. And I think it's uh, something that they should definitely still keep their heads high about. Um, they, it, it, barring a disaster in the final game, Napoli should be advancing to the knockout stages, second in that group. So uh, both of those teams, as far as uh, Europe goes, should be happy again. It would take uh, something of uh, catastrophic proportions for Napoli to uh, fall out of there. Uh, obviously, you got to play the games. You never rule anything out, but I highly doubt that they do not advance out of their group. So uh, they should be seeing that. Milan, well, that's a different story. We're going to talk about Milan Fiorentina. Milan getting the victory 1 0 was a PK. Uh, Teo Hernandez stepping up and burying it. And then. Uh, my God, man, uh, Mike Mignon just ended up being massive for them in yeah. this one. This team continues to just really, really struggle in a lot of phases. But while everyone's shouting Pioli out, I'm saying you guys have to be a little more realistic with who's on the pitch for this team because this midfield for me is absolutely dreadful. And it's not much better at the back. And I just, uh, I feel like, uh, you know, Pioli has taken that scapegoat thing for Milan. Yep. There are quite a few fans that are saying, and Milan fans that I talk to that are saying, you know what, let's just tough it out for till season's end. And I honestly would probably have to agree, but, I mean, man, I look at that team and I think I'm not sure what is expected with this group of players. They go into European play and they get bounced. They are out. Uh, Dortmund beating them 3-1. And, uh, you know, just not surprised. Like, I, I'm just, I'm not surprised. It, it, it didn't surprise me one bit. Your thoughts on everything going on in Milan and how you feel about Pioli? Uh, I have a soft spot for him. I'll end with that, I guess. But uh, listen, I think you're absolutely right. And and I say this as somebody who jokes about Saudi, but you can draw a lot of parallels to what you as a UAE fan have probably gone through with Allegri, right? And, and how time. this Milan team is performing currently. This is a team that I, I think it's, it's not the best 23-man roster that Milan has ever had, right? We could say the same about Juve in the past couple of years. Um, they're dealing with a ton of injuries. Oh, I mean, wow. too many to even keep track of. We've seen that with Juve over the past two or three years. Um, and, and what do you expect, right? This guy is not a miracle worker. You're exactly right. He's he's proven himself. He has a good track record. He's won a Scudetto. Um, I, I don't know what magic you think he can come up with. And they put a lot of new players in this squad, uh, right, over the course of the, of the offseason. They've had to do a lot of financial gymnastics they've had to bring in yeah. guys um 
brought in a lot of different guys from a lot of different leagues, a lot of different backgrounds. So it was always going to be difficult to gel. Um, and their defending and their goalkeeping has been great, right? But now everybody's hurt. So it, it's impossible to to get those same results, right, out of out of guys that you're going to have to trot out there. I mean, I heard they're bringing up two or three guys from the reserve team just to, to field the team this week. So what, yeah. what do you expect? Um, so I think it's... I agree with you, I guess is what I'm saying, right? I think it's uh, the, the expectations may be a little bit too high, and that could be because they started off the year so well, right? They were creating a ton of chances. Um, Pulisic looked really good. Uh, Reinders looked really good. Um, I, I think Giroud got off to a really good start maybe in the first month of the season. He's certainly cooled down since. So they looked the part until the beat down at the hands of Inter, right? Then that just yeah. kind of derailed their entire season. I mean, um, and then the Champions League, same same story. Those first two games against uh, Dortmund and Newcastle, they absolutely dominated both of those games. 0-0 zero, zero draw, both of those games. That set the tone for that entire group. If, if those games are replayed 10 times, they're winning 10 out of 10, right? So... Yeah. Uh, perfect storm. I, I think they had over 20 shots in both of those games, if I remember correctly. So like just perfect storm of not getting the results. And now, um, you know, they, they've, they've run into this injury crisis, this fatigue crisis, this Pioli is maybe out of ideas crisis. And, um, yeah. you know, it, it's just, I give him credit uh, for trying luck. things though, because he was, he was trying to, you know, alter some things, change setup a little bit and whatnot, but, uh, it is what it is. They're just, uh, in a funk and, uh, they got to grind their way out of it. Um, we will talk about their matchup coming up, uh, but yeah, they are bounced out of European play. Milan's going to be one of those uh, teams that is going to have all eyes on them moving forward. And Pioli, to say he's on a hot seat is, uh, yeah, understatement of the year so far. So we'll see what happens. Cagliari, Monza, played out to a tight 1-1 draw. And to be honest, there was chances both ways. I think in the end, a draw was fair. Um, Cagliari, I mean, God, they're going to be happy with any points they get. But Monza is at ninth, 18 points, and they are going to be extremely happy. Paladino continues to just yep. work wonders uh, with the squad that uh, he's been given. And Colpani keeps uh, turning heads and putting in uh, good shift after good shift. So definitely uh, a fun team to watch is uh, Monza for sure. Any quick thoughts on that one? Yeah, I was going to say Mons is a great story. I mean, they're what unbeaten in four matches. They've scored more goals than they've conceded. I mean, this is yeah. their what second, third year that they've been up in Serie A. They, they've yeah. been a dynamite story. So I'm rooting for them. I mean, you know, good for them. I I, I think eighth place, ninth place, tenth place. That's probably their ceiling. But if they can continue to get the results against teams around them. Good for them, uh, you know, and credit to them even in this game. Right away from home, Calgary is not an easy place to play, regardless of you know who's on the field for Calgary. Um, yeah. They were down a goal very, very early, so the fact that they were able to to find the resolve and, and get a result, maybe it's not the result they wanted, but to get something yeah. out of that game, um, I think since Paladino's has taken over, right? They've they've had that belief that they they're in every single game, and that's what and we saw become- last week they kind of become one of those teams that if you want a young guy and you want to send them on loan, that is one of the target clubs you want to get them on. Um, Cause yep. man, they're getting the minutes. He has no fear and they're rewarding him with good shift after good shift. So yeah, it's a, it's a hot spot, I think for young players, uh, loan ease, right? So one to watch one team to watch for sure. Frozenone is another one. Wow. So Barnechea yeah. and Sule. Juve's B side, I'm watching these guys all the time, and they're balling out there. Um, they get the job done against Genoa at home, 2-1. Late goal wins it. Sule again bags the first one for uh, Frozenone. They are a fun team to watch. Um, they create like crazy. They get after it. Um, yeah, it, it's just a, it's just a fun side to watch. Again, they're sitting in 10th, 18 points. They're level with uh, Monza. Um, they've obviously allowed a couple more goals and they've, uh, been able to score whatnot, but, uh, a, a good side, uh, to watch and, um, good at home. 
uh, away from home is where Frozenone's troubles have kind of come. But uh, again, uh, mid table, they're going to take that all day, all day, every day, twice on Sunday. But a fun, fun team to watch, man, for sure. Any thoughts there with uh, Frozenone? Yeah, I mean, you want to talk about a, a prediction that I got dreadfully wrong, not just myself. I think the odds makers, right? They were the odds on favor to go back down, uh, right? They they came up. I took a look at the squad list, and this was before some of these loan moves. And I, you know, I couldn't name, uh, I didn't know anybody, right? Who, who are these guys? So, yeah. yeah, this team is going to be nothing. And then I saw DeFrancesco's their coach. I'm like, oh, this guy is an absolute joke. This is going to be an easy three points for everybody. So, um, nothing more for me to say, man. Could not have yeah. been more wrong. You mentioned it. Sule has been outstanding. Uh, they've gotten good performances. Seems to me like all around, right? Um, you know, only only five losses through 13 games. I mean, that's a pretty big accomplishment compared to where I thought they would be. And they're yeah. ahead of Lazio. So what more can I say? Yeah, there you go, man. Uh, there's quite a few teams that are ahead of that are actually uh, shocking, right? But to be mid-table this way, this many games through, yeah, very, very surprised. And a, like I said, just a fun team to watch. Now we get to a goal fest. This thing was wild. So Sassuolo getting the job done 4-3 away from home to uh, Empoli. Berardi ends up winning it. Empoli is going to be absolutely livid to lose it late like that. Um, Sassuolo's got to be livid that they allowed Empoli to score three goals on them because Empoli has had a major problem bagging goals this season. In the end, Sassuolo gets the win. Like I said, Empoli's going to be uh, very, very distraught about this one at home when you get that shot. But these are... uh, Empoli, there's not much, uh, it's not really a whole lot to say, man. They're going to be in that relegation zone, I think, yep. all year long. Um, they're level on points with Cagliari. Obviously, Cagliari has a much better goal differential because Empoli just hasn't been able to uh, find the back in the net. We're in match week 14 heading into. They've only scored eight goals so far. So, uh, just uh, a massive, massive problem there for them and the amount that they've allowed. I mean, you're 17 goals to the negative on uh, differential. Uh, I don't expect Empoli to be leaving the relegation zone, to be honest. And Sassuolo is sitting in 14th with 15 points, but they are going to be Jekyll and Hyde the whole way through. Like They just uh, can't keep it out of the back of their net. They're at a minus four goal differential, allowing 24, scoring 20. I just see a team that uh, you don't know what you're going to get from one week to the next with Sassuolo. I definitely never feel confident in taking them whenever I do choose them. But, uh, yeah, it, it's going to be one of those uh, teams that uh, I think is just uh, flip a coin from one week to the next with Sassuolo. Agree? Absolutely agree. I, I think you even gave Empoli too much credit with eight goals because three of those goals were in this game. So they exactly. had five goals coming into it, right? Um, less than half a goal a game. It's almost like a, a third of a goal per game. Um, but, no, I, I think we know exactly what to make of Sassuolo. I think they have – quite possibly the worst defense in the entire league. Uh, statistically, they've given up 24 goals. Cagliari and Empoli have given up 25. But I think if you watch Sassuolo, they just look worse. I haven't seen one game where you know, you're know you ever confident that they're going to be able to hold on to a lead. I don't care if it's one goal, two goals, if it's a tie game. Um, they're terrible. And, and yes, I agree with you. Empoli is going to be upset that they wasted a three-goal performance. I highly doubt they get another one this year. But... Um, Sassuolo, man, if, if anybody's into betting, they are the easiest team to bet overs. Uh, you can almost do it blindly, right? They score a decent amount, 20 goals scored, but they give up even more. So, yeah. um, you know, seven goals in this one, that's not abnormal. We've seen 4-2 sc- uh, score lines all year. We've seen, you know, 3-1 score lines all year. You can basically pencil in three goals a game no matter what. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, and I mean, obviously they're gonna have uh, Roma this uh, weekend, and that's gonna be an interesting matchup, which we'll highlight in a bit. Um, we got a couple of quick ones. We're gonna kind of machine gun through here. Verona and Lecce, uh, Udin with an absolute screamer uh, for the first one here, and that was an I would have called that one a much better goal uh, than uh, Candreva's from this weekend. Yes. That was an absolute screamer. But this was actually. A really good watch this game. Man, both teams getting after. And I I literally called it last week because I said, 
if you're Verona, if you're Lecce, this is a game both teams are going to enter going for max because you think like this is where we got to get uh, one of those wins. In the end, a draw makes sense, makes sense. Um, but uh, Lecce is kind of leveling off after a red hot start. They're sitting in 13th spot with 15 points. Obviously going to be happy that a solid cushion above the relegation zone and whatnot. And I think they'll be kind of in that area you know uh from 12th to 15th i think uh this season so they're kind of right where they need to be verona is uh struggling big time so they're on nine points they're in the relegation zone and honestly i'm not seeing any signs that they're really gonna get out of there man um i think they're gonna be in there what do you think yeah, I agree. This is what their their first points in the last five or six matches. Um, it, it's a team we had pegged to go down at the beginning of the year. So I, I think they're fortunate that Empoli and Cagliari Salernitana are also been poor. Udinese has been probably a little worse than people thought. Um, already fired their coach. So I, I think it's going to be a battle to the end. But yeah, this... this uh, Verona team doesn't score enough. I mean, you know, two goals yeah. in a game that probably happens three or four times throughout the course of the season. So they're going to be upset to not have all three points. Yeah, absolutely. And then we get to uh, Roma Udinese. Roma getting the job done three one, but this game was actually tight until late, and uh, a beautiful second goal from Roma has to be said. Uh, Dybala and then El Sharawi uh, seals the deal. Udinese. Just a ton of talk about a team with a ton of injuries, too. Like, they've had a ton. Sotil was uh, hard done by by all those injuries. Yeah. De La Feu hurts them big time, uh, not having him in. Uh, Samarzic can kind of only do so much. They, they just it's been a perfect storm for Udinese this season, um, yeah. on everything that can go wrong. That said, they've managed to get eight draws out of the 13 match week, so the games are tight. But, uh, you know, they just couldn't pick up uh, the wins in uh, those because they've literally only sitting on one win. But it's just uh, it's a it's a rough one. I don't think they're going to give themselves a lot of breathing room throughout this season, especially if what I hope goes down in January goes down. And that's Samardzic heading over to uh, Juventus. Then uh, I might get a little rockier there. But, uh, yeah, it, it just is as it is with Roma. Yeah. Roma is yet another one on the list that we can say in City as unconvincing. Yeah. And for me, yeah. they are largely unconvincing. I look at their roster. They have a lot of injuries too. They're starting to get healthier. Yeah. But for me, it's a, a pretty underwhelming Roma roster, especially at the back, even in the midfield, I'd say. And I mean, it's no surprise. You kind of get what you get in terms of Europa. They got a 1-1 draw with Servette, and uh, Mourinho had some harsh words. And again, Mourinho calling his players out. Uh, Awar was the main one, and just, you know, saying it how it is and saying there are players that uh, pick themselves up for the occasion, and there are some that uh, don't take this competition seriously. And... Harsh, harsh words. Uh, Mo's going to be Mo all the time, but uh, his team is is very, very unconvincing all year. You don't know what the hell you're going to get from one week to the next. Is it going to be the Roma that bags three? Is it going to be the Roma that can't score and gets a you know a clean sheet against them for a couple matches in a row? You don't really know. Lukaku has been a positive for them because he is Definitely. getting his job done. Dybala, like I said, was one of those injuries. So there's hope that they'll get in there. In the end, I do expect them to get one of those fifth or sixth spots. Do you think they'll slide yeah. out of there and be able to get into that spot this year? Yeah, I agree. I, I think that's that's where they are. I mean, they, to me, from the outside looking in, have the most realistic shot at fourth um, because I think of what you mentioned, right? First of all, they have Mourinho. Um, I'll get into him in a second. But you have a Lukaku and a Dybala who are starting on any team in the league, right? Let's... Let's agree to that. These two guys are class. Um, injuries have hurt, right? Pellegrini, I feel like we haven't seen the best out of him in the past two yeah. years. Uh, but the rest of the squad is okay, right? There, there's some good serviceable players, but it's not a, a team that's stacked. That I don't think they compete with an Inter, with a Napoli, with a Juve. Um, so I look at it. 
kind of in two ways. Like there's there's one side of me that says, okay, we're in also year three of Mourinho. Well, this team is finished in sixth and seventh place. So what what did we really get out of Mourinho, right? But then I, I also look at them, the players they have, the performances they've put in so far. I think they have the most runway, right? We, we haven't seen the best Roma yet, at least not in the league. And I give him a lot of credit for what he said today, right? Like, I, I think he knows that he's in a competition that they can win. They won the Conference League two years ago. They were in the finals of the Europa League last year. He should have the belief, these players should have the belief that they can go far in that competition. So I, I give him credit for not pulling any punches. But at the same time, the results eventually have to come. I, I mean, I think a lot of their issues do stem from goalkeeping. I think... They've had different defenders every year. Um, even the, you know, uh, Smalling's been hurt and he's been really, really good for them. But they, they haven't really been able to figure all that out. I mean, they're still giving up over a goal a game in Serie A. That's not what you want to see. Yeah. So, to, I mean, a long way of saying I agree with you, right? You don't know what you're going to get. But I think what I'm trying to say is we should be getting better at this point in the Mourinho project yeah. with the players they have. Yeah, it'll be. Uh, I I think that they will get better. I think it will improve, and I think ultimately they should be safe in one of those uh, fifth or sixth spots. And they could have a shot at uh, four. Like I said, you're looking at top four. Inter, Juve, I think they're clear, and it's fair to yes. say, Napoli, I think, is not out of any running yet. And this weekend could make a big, big shift in that. Milan, I can see Milan dropping off and Roma possibly surpassing them. And that's why I think Roma's got a shot. But we got to talk about Bologna because Bologna got the job done against Inter 2-0. We know that they're without Orsolini. They're going to be out without him for a while, which does hurt them. It's already a team that doesn't score a lot of goals as they've scored 15 in the league. But they've only allowed... 10. They are very well organized with Mota. They approach every game as a new battle and he is tweaking things for his opponents specifically. He's doing a really really good job and the results are uh, coming forth in this one against Torino. Fabian with his first Serie A start had himself a game man. Looking great there. They did have a r absolute rocket that was called back for offside too. Like in the end, they get it done. Uh, Xerxes has his uh, killer that gets called off too after Fabian gets his goal, but it ended up standing. It's two nil. Bologna just keeps on rolling along. Like I said, it was two weeks ago they got the streak of like th ten games unbeaten, broken, yep. but. Uh, Man, 21 points, tied with Roma for fifth, three points away from Napoli on fourth. Bologna's goal this season was to get one of those European spots, and they're setting themselves up properly, and Mota is looking very, very strong in doing so as well. This team is probably one of the best organized in the league for the opponents they are going to face, but... Good, good stuff. And I know you love yourself some Bologna talk, so let's go, man. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. And it's so funny, man. started as a joke. I was getting frustrated with Lazio, and I'm like, you know what? Uh, I'm starting a new movement. I'm picking a team that, you know, their their ceiling is like eighth place. Their floor is like 12th. That's not going to matter week to week if they win, if they lose, if they draw. I'm just going to watch them. It's going to be enjoyable. Bologna is the team. I love Orsolini. He's my favorite player in the league. So I'm like, yeah, I'm going with it. And I just ran wild. And now everybody loves Thiago Mota. And it's it's kind of great to see. Uh, I think, as you mentioned, he's kind of um, – he, he's just that guy, right? He's, he's young enough, I think, to relate to the players. He's accomplished enough to have authority. Um, and he's probably flexible enough where a lot of our other coaches don't have that in them. And – they have some players that have quality. Um, you know, you mentioned um, Orsolini, who I love, of course, is is I, I think the you know the the guy, the the old school talent. You know, wants the ball all the time, still gets back and defends. I think he plays really hard. He doesn't have the stats maybe that you would like to see out yeah. of somebody with so much talent, but is what it is. I mean, he's playing wing and and usually a three-man formation behind the striker. 
Um, we, Lewis Ferguson is a guy that's been outstanding for two years. I mean, he will probably be at a much bigger club as early as next year. He's on uh, UV think, and Inter's radar, according to the latest reports. Yeah. Yep. As well, he should be. Um, I think, you know, Xerxes has been good. I, I don't think he's a guy that's going to consistently get you 15, 20 goals, but I think he... It's another guy that works hard. He could probably play in different areas if they're to switch up formation. So it's always good to see. Um, two of the guys that really have stood out to me, Calafiori in the back has been outstanding. And uh, Liko Giannis as well, the, the Greek defender. I think those two guys have been really good. Um, goaltending has been good to this point. And like you said, like somebody like Fabian, who, by the way, uh, before they went bankrupt, he saved Regina's season last year. He was outstanding on loan. So, I, you know, I followed him. That's the team where my family's from. So I have a soft spot for him. Glad he wound up at Bologna. Um, everybody's just kind of gelling. It, it's, it, you know, I, you don't see too many egos. Um, you don't see, uh, at least I haven't heard it. Maybe I'm not looking for it, but I haven't heard too many negative things around the players, around the teams. Um, and they're playing with nothing to lose. So I, I think all of that has just turned itself into an enjoyable team. Like I said, you know, I was going in expecting just to, to have some fun watching games and yeah, here they are picking up points week in and week out. And here's, and here's the thing. While we l- talked about the teams around them, you have Fiorentina who Italiano, everybody wants to talk about Italiano, etc. Yeah. They're not scoring goals. Uh, they had a streak of three games where they couldn't bag goals, and I know everybody wants to talk about uh, quality up front and there whatnot. Nonetheless, you know you got it. You got to figure it out. So Italiano's getting all this for me. Fiorentina is hit and miss. We talked about Atalanta not scoring the way they typically can. You've got Roma. Roma. We're waiting for Roma to show us our best and whatnot. So we've got all this you know, unconvincing performances, but then you have Bologna sitting right there. That for me is convincing because they're solid and they're steady. You know, every time they go out there, it's going to be a battle. You know, it's going to be a grind. It's not a gimme by any means and they're proving it. So, you know, their numbers, nothing to write home about 15 goals for 10 against, but again, it really doesn't matter. All that matters is the results. And I'll go as far to say this as well. Mota doesn't get as much hype as these other guys because everybody likes the sexy game and the numbers and the Mm -hmm. goals and all this. But if, and it pains me to say this because of the ties with Inter, it really hurts, okay? But uh, Mota is a guy I'd probably put at the top of the list for a shot at a big club before Italiano, before De Zerbi, before, like for me, what he's doing makes the most sense because we all want to talk about this this flash, this modern game and everything like that. But there's a lot to be said about doing, you know, getting the most out of what you have. And man, he is doing exactly that. And some of these managers get hit for you know style of play and right now i i'm my team i see it week in week out style of play and i'm starting to fight a different battle and say we got to start being realistic and myself included with what we thought we had as far as a roster goes but managers like this when you give a manager like that more talent i think then the style comes and if you don't it's like saying, you know, and I've been saying this for a week too. It's like, I want to go out and street race. I'm not going to go out there and buy a Prius. You know, like we got to be realistic here. I'm going to say this. Mota's doing a hell of a job and managers like that. Those are kind of the guys that, uh, you know, can do damage when you do give them the talent and whatnot. These other guys, I feel like, you know, at the Zerbi, even an Italiano, I feel like they're, they have so much belief in their style that it's a fault because I yes. feel like they would rather lose going out that manner than making the, like the switch and adapting and getting the result. Yep. That's just how I feel. What do you think? No, I, I could not agree more. You hit the nail on the head on every single point that you made. I think Fiorentina is the best example of that. They've gotten hype. 
for absolutely nothing. Uh, they haven't scored goals consistently for three, four years now. With, um, I think the Zerbi is a, a little bit of a better story because, you know, he went abroad and he went on a nice little streak. But now we see them, they're in what, sixth, seventh place in the Premier yeah. League. Uh, not to say that it's easy, right? And the team he has is the team he has, but trying to shoehorn players into your system because it's your system. It doesn't work long term. We're seeing that with Lazio now. Um, you know, that's one of my complaints with Saudi in the four three three. I think you're exactly right. I think Malta is one hundred percent on the right track. And um that's why I mean I've I've joked about it, you know, for years when Juve was going through their turmoil, right? The 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 memes of Allegri in his face, like I couldn't get enough of it. I was enjoying it. I was right there with everybody else. But for me, he's the best manager in the league. I don't, I don't even like it's, it's uh, Allegri and it's Inzaghi one and two. And I, I don't know that there's even a close third because like you said, come to grips with who's on the roster. He gets three points at the end of the day. That's all I care about. I could yeah. give a shit what it looks like. Take the three points. And, and I can't see how people, I, I think like the Barcelona's and the Pep Guardiola's of the world have ruined that maybe for some people, right? Because yeah. now we're accustomed to seeing it. That's not reality for 99% of teams. Get the three points. Yeah. And speaking of that, obviously we get to uh, the final game we got to talk about, which was the big battle, Juve and Inter. And you got Allegri and Inzaghi going at it. And funny thing was, is it went down exactly how I thought it was going to go down. I said, when we talk about these two managers, one of the things I said in our pregame show was, for me, they are exactly the same guy. Um, for me, they are methodical in approaches. I go, Inter's got their bagging goals. They got the most goals in the league and everything. But for me, Inzaki is just as pragmatic as Allegri. The difference is the quality. I said, look at the quality of players. Look at the midfield. I said, you know, it's, it's not, you can't even compare the two midfields when we have a midfield of McKinney, Caviglia and Rabio to uh, Barella, Chalanoglu, and Mkhitaryan, uh, who's, you know, been, he's a seasoned vet and everything, but he's got a good game to him. And you got Di Marco that you're also going to throw on one of the flanks. You've got Dumfries on another one. Dumfries gets a lot of flack from Inter fans, but to be honest, he's a handful, and you do have to watch out for him. Taram, I wanted Taram badly of the from Juventus. Yep. I always said last season, I said, bring me Taram because he can play anywhere up top him and Lotharo, that combination just hit the ground running they're flying for me these are two managers that are extremely alike the only difference is one is dealing with a hell of a lot more quality allegri doesn't even have a creative profile in the midfield period because pogba got his doping case uh, fajoli got his betting scandal we don't even have that actual profile for me I started watching a couple games and there's about three games that completely changed my opinion on what we have in the midfield. And I saw a midfield that can't win a battle against inferior uh, players. And for me, that's just unacceptable. You can't impose yourself in a game like Verona, like Cagliari, when you have time and space in the middle of the park. For me, that's just where I saw that it has nothing to do with Massimiliano Allegri, in my opinion. Because coaches are not out there with uh, remote control. This is not FIFA. Like These guys have to think on their feet, think with their heads, and make the right decision, make the passes. you know. And they're making simple, fundamental errors over and over and over. And for me, it, just, uh, it was an eye-opener. And I'm like, you know what? This midfield needs some major major help so for everyone that's begging for this change of style whatever and i even say go back to max's first tenure juve did not play like this whatsoever but we had a midfield like i'm talking a midfield when did it all start changing when the midfield needed a massive boost and we never got that Sari never got it okay we were bringing players in but come on ramsey rabios had one good year out of four like Arthur, it's not been boosted. It has not been boosted. And Pirlo saw it as well. And now we're seeing Max actually getting a lot. And for what he did in this game, 
This game, the first half was intense, and it was a hell of a half. Both teams ended up only scoring on each other's mistake, and I called it. I said, second half, I guarantee you, neither team leaves themselves open for the other to score. Watch this one play out in a draw. And it did. And to be honest, the draw was fine for both teams, and I expected yep. it. What would you think? Yeah, that, that's... um. It's funny. That's how we had the game handicapped. We we previewed it as well on our show. We had uh we had the under and uh I I had Juve plus uh they you know, they were the underdogs. So if you got them on the spread, you got Juve plus half a goal. That's what I personally bet. So I, I anticipated a, a Juve win or a draw. That's what happened. Um and you know, it, maybe a little bit of hard luck. I think Juve could have gone up maybe two goals early. Uh the fact that they didn't Inter got that you know, that, that, like you said, capitalized on a mistake, got that quick counter. Probably fair for both teams. Uh, it, like, like you said, nobody wanted to lose this game. Uh, you know, not that it was, I think it's way too early in the season to have been decisive anyway, but yeah, to walk out of it with a point, um, you know, I think especially Inter, you know, away, uh, you're feeling pretty good about it. And I think, you know, neither team, played excellent but neither team played poorly so you yeah. you you leave with your head held high i think uh you've also got to like really realize like i mean you gave a first debut start to cavilia in this game yeah. and you really didn't give up anything in the middle played smart tactically you had shots in the first half my god i think kiesa could take that shot another 90 times and hit 88 yeah. out of those 90 but he missed yeah. that one in the first at least and hit the target I don't care if it's so yeah. the thing I always say, and, and granted, listen, it's, it may look easy uh, on replay. It may look easy, whatever, like, dude, that's not an easy shot first and foremost, but you got to hit the target, right? You make the goal, make there. the save. Yeah. That's, that's always kind of my philosophy. And I feel like players lose sight of that sometimes, right? They want to hit the upper 90. They want to make sure the keeper can't get to it. Like got put it on goal. Something might happen. Target. Got to hit target there. But nonetheless, the draw is good. And like I said, now we're going to get into the games coming up this weekend. Juve set themselves up nicely. Well, did they? Because they got Monza. And Monza had our number last year. But Inter's going to head to the Maradona to play Napoli. So we're going to get into these games quick and try and preview them as quick as possible. I will say Inter had themselves a hell of a game in Europe with Benfica. Uh, João Mario with the hat trick in the first half. Um, But... Uh, I jinxed it. I jinxed it on Twitter. I came out there. Yes, I did. was laughing. You were, yes, you did. Sure but, but you owned shit. it. 3-3 three, three <laughs> draw, and I said, yeah, you guys can all come at me. That's my bad, all right? My bad. And I fully owned up to it. I fully accepted it. It is what it is. Uh, but Inter, uh, a big, big second half. And um, their backups, though, I think show you that maybe, just maybe, they got to really bank on that health for the Scudetto yeah. and European play because I think there's a big, big drop-off there. And maybe the depth isn't as, you know, as big as what it's made out to be. We'll see. I'll, I'll, so I'll hit you with the counterpoint there. I mean, they made way more changes than you would normally make in a yeah. typical match, right, from game to game. Uh, it was, what, Aldero's first start. Um, it, Alexis Sanchez, I mean, you know, I don't know that he's going to get another start up front all year. Maybe he will, but you know, it, I, I don't put too, too much stock in that. I would say I give Inzaghi a little bit of credit for going down three, nothing, leaving them in there to see how they responded a little bit. I think they got a goal back and then started making yeah. those changes to bring in some more of the regulars. The fact that they came back to, you know, a, a team that didn't play all that well in the champions league. You know, in a very, very, very tough group, right? I mean, um, Ella even hit know, uh, the woodwork. Uh, could have made it four three, and they could have yeah. walked out there with a win. So they and, did. And I'm sorry, they, that was a massive. It was a massive, massive comeback. But yeah, and I don't know Benfica standing in Portugal right now. I mean, I know they're perennially, you know, top two, top three, top four team. But you know, listen, winless in this group. But they were the worst team in this group coming in. So yeah. Um, the fact that Inter could come back, uh, you have to give them a little bit of credit. And I think swapping in two players at a time or going to some of these players off the bench in a match situation, I, I think the depth is still good. Yeah. Now you got uh, one we didn't touch on with Milan Fiorentina, but Fiorentina qualify for the knockouts in Conference League after a 2-1 victory over Genk, okay? Now... Your standings, okay, as we get into uh, 
matched a uh, 14 here. Inter obviously at the top with 32 points. Juve next with 30 points. You have Milan at 26, Napoli at 24. That's your top four. Fifth and sixth, even at 21 points, Roma and Bologna. Atalanta on 20, Fiorentina on 20, Monza on 18, Frosinone on 18. That's your top 10. Lazio right on the cusp there with 17 points. Torino 16, Lecce 15, Sassuolo 15, Genoa 14. Outside of that, Udinese, Cagliari, Empoli, Verona, Salernitana. Make up your cellar and take your pick at who's probably going out. All right. Now we get into these games. We're going to kick things off with Juve actually because that's going to be tomorrow's game. And that's Monza and Juventus. No surprises from Monza. They're going to go 3-4-3. They're going to drop those outsides back, make that uh, five-man wall, and that is the blueprint to give Juventus fits. All right, so all I'm going to say in this one is the projected lineup for Juventus does see that it's going to be Cambiasso on the right side, Kostic on the left. What does that mean for Juventus? It means that McKinney is going to be in the midfield with Locatelli and Rabio. If Locatelli cannot play, that means Caviglia will take his spot. For me... The one alteration I make here with this lineup is I move McKenney to the right wing back role. And the reason I do that is because when a team does this to Juventus, you're going to shut down the flanks. That's what Mons is going to do. We have to play through centrally. It makes absolutely no sense to have both Rabio and McKenney occupying the midfield as your two Mitsalas. Get somebody that can create and hit those pockets of space, which Miretti exploits very, very well. This is a game you got to use Miretti. I would also make an argument that it might be a game that you do use somebody like Illing Jr. that can win 1v1s as one of your outside players. Or maybe you choose Kostic or McKenney play one of them and use Cambiasso as well. That can work 1-2s very well, but you're going to have to ramp up the creativeness in the roster because if you play that same setup that we did against Inter against this five-man block I could see it ended up just being Kostic and he's just going to dump crosses all day and when one of your forwards is Chiesa and you don't get the mids up enough to support it's not going to make a whole lot of sense for me you got to get some creativity in there what do you think about this one what is your call for the result so the 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 only thing I'll say about having McKenney in there is I think he's actually very good uh, with his head. And I think he's very, he, his instincts are much better than I feel like he gets credit for from UVA fans. Um, you know, I don't know if it's bias. I don't know what it is, but I, I think he could be useful. I know you mentioned not taking him off the field, just moving his position, but I, I do think he deserves a place. My question for you is what, has to happen for Kostic to get benched. Uh, for me, I can't understand this guy. I understand he came in with a lot of hype from Germany. Uh, I know he had actually a, a pretty decent year last year, right? He had a, he certainly had a stretch of like four or five, six games where he was like the man. But outside of that, I've seen absolutely nothing from this guy. Uh, his crosses aren't even accurate. He's, it's like he's crossing blind, right? He's, he's hitting the, the square button on PlayStation. I, I don't know. Um, I, I would love to know, other than obviously the fact that this is the formation Juve play, how is this guy playing every single minute? Uh, I just don't quite understand that as an outsider. Out of the other guys available, he is the best defensively. Um, okay. And that's and the fact that his energy rate and his work rate through a full 90 is massive, I think that's what gets him his minutes all the time. His numbers are good, but I've always said it's deceiving based on the amount that he pumps into the area. I mean, yeah, I, I could go out there and pump in cross after cross after cross. I'm going to be getting assists because they're going to be getting to some eventually. And one of the things is, is that Juve actually is very, very good on set pieces. When you're going to have... Danilo back. Uh, he he is back on the squad list for this game. I'm not so sure he's going to be starting, but Danilo, Bremer, McKenny, Rabio. We have targets. We have guys that yeah. can get Milik when he's in there. So set pieces are no surprise to me that we create havoc on Gatti is another one. He's a unit. But uh, yeah, Kostic is kind of uh, this guy for me that's very, very one-dimensional. Um, he doesn't work the exchanges, those interchanges, those one-twos I yep. was talking about with Cambiasso. Cambiasso seems to fit with Chiesa a lot better. When you have Miretti in there as well, and you have Cambiasso, Miretti, and Chiesa, 
it's fantastic. It's a thing of beauty to watch them operate together. However, you do sacrifice a little bit in terms of uh, the defensor, but we have more than enough to make up for that. Right. Uh, Rugani's been solid for several years yeah. now. He's back there. You've got Bremer, who's a monster. I think he just needs to take Taram down in that last game, for God's sakes. you got to take the <laughs> professional foul there. But... We're, we're saw Locatelli is a beast defensively. Uh, that's one thing nobody can ever take away from him. Uh, for me, Kostic, uh, he's, he's got his part one up. But like I said, in a game like this, he becomes a little uh, way too one-dimensional. And yep. he's not going to do a whole lot. We have to think about breaking that five-man uh, wall and moving in centrally. So I see a guy like Cambiasso, even Illing Jr., being being uh, better for us in there. For McKenny, McKenny's been having a great season, but he's better at right wing back than he is at midfield because, again, if Rabio is also going to be in there, you just can't have the two of them sharing a midfield. Yeah. You have to take your pick between those two guys as who you want to be your engine. And Cambiasso, where did he play last year? Cambiasso was with Genoa. No, come on. Wasn't he with Bologna? Was he with Bologna? Yeah, yeah, I was so setting was you up Bologna. for that. Come on, was I was setting you up. I was setting you up. Man, for I thought it, it was to, Genoa. To give Bologna some props. Now you have me second guessing it because you said it so convincingly. I thought it was Genoa. Don't don't say this to me. I'm tell me I've been wrong this whole time. And I do get Genoa and Bologna. You know the colors. No, man, I get them man, mixed up. But no, 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 I'm gonna have to look it up. Okay, um, look it up. But uh, what's your call I, I in this have... game? What do you think the result's gonna be? I, I, I like a Juve win in this game. I actually bet Juve win uh, gave that out as one of my plays uh, we recorded last night. So I, I think Juve get it done. I, I think it is going to be a battle. I think it's going to be low scoring, but um, I, I, 2-1, or 1-0, 2-0. I, I think Juve find a way to get it done over 90 minutes. Yeah, I, I like I'm going to go with 2-0 uh, in this one. I've got Juve winning. And uh, I think you're right. I think it was Bologna, man. No. Man, uh, you, you, I don't know how you have me second guessing it because I watched them all last year. But now, like the way you said Genoa, I'm like, oh, uh. now Genoa, that's our next game. Genoa and Empoli. No, dude, all right. Bologna. So, okay, now let's clear the is Bologna. Like, it, uh, you made there me go, you go nuts there for a second. Genoa and Empoli. So, oh man, four points separate these two sides. Genoa is going to be happy to be home because they are better off at home. And Empoli. Uh, is funny enough, is better on the road, okay? And coming off a game where they did net three on Sassuolo, maybe they'll, uh, you know, have some uh, fortune here against Genoa. This one is a tough one to call, though. I mean, oh, man, this is a really, really tough one awesome. to call. Empoli on eight goals, but getting three against Sassuolo. Genoa is got 14 bagged at least, so a little over one goal a game, 18 against. They do... I see both teams scoring in this one. Uh, could easily see a draw, but I'm actually going to pick Genoa to get the edge because they're at home. So I'm going to go with a Genoa win. What do you think? I absolutely agree with what you're saying. I think it very easily could be a draw. It's a toss-up game, 100%. Got to go with the home side. I think Gunmanson has been outstanding for this team. Uh, it's a shame that Rategi has been hurt more than he's been healthy because um, – it's another guy I think is very unfairly hated. I think he has outstanding instincts. And the two of them together, if we're able to see that for, you know, once he gets healthy in a long stretch of the season, I think this team climbs out of the cellar and, you know, they're going to stay up. And got to give props to Gilad. You know, I don't, you know, I don't know what to make of him yet, but it's cool that he's in this position with a young, scrappy team. And I'm rooting for them. There you go. There you go. Next up, Leche and Bologna. Bologna, a lot of Bologna talk. All right, so Lecce, no wins at home in the last four matches. Bologna, six clean sheets in their 13 matches. Um, Lecce, we talked about red hot out of the gates, leveling off Bologna. Steady, Eddie, for me, this one, I'm going with Bologna to get the victory on the road, and I think it's going to be a 1-0 game. Um, they might get two. But uh, I don't think Lecce is going to break them, even though they're at home. And uh, I yeah. think Bologna gets the W here. What do you think? Yeah, I'm going to go out on a limb and say Bologna gets more than one goal in this game. I think uh, Lecce's D has been very poor. I think, you know, we, we talked about the game against uh, Hellas last week. They were very fortunate to not give up 
more than just those two goals. Um, I think Verona had them really on the ropes for the last 10, 15 minutes of that game. Hit a post, if I'm not mistaken, or crossbar or something. So Bologna, as you said, they could have had more than the two goals that they even had this past week. I think they're starting to round into something of offensive form. Lecce is just what the doctor ordered. I will go with a 2-0 win. There you go. There you go. Now we get to Milan and Frosinone. All right. So Milan obviously bounced in Europe, got the victory against uh, Fiorentina unconvincingly. Their fans continue to want more, demanding more. We still have Giroud out for this one last game of the suspension that he's going to be facing. No Leal, no Okafor. We know the story there. And uh, Frosinone not going to be happy to be on the road. Lost each of their last four away from home. But this is where so far we're right on cue with each other as far as the predictions go. But I'm actually going to call this one ending in a draw. A surprise draw. And... Uh, yeah, I think uh, the fire just keeps uh, getting more fuel dumped on it for Milan because I'm going draw on this. Dude, it's like I'm copying your picks at this point. 2-2 two, two draw. I oh. with this one. I think Frosinone continue to score, but Milan is going to put some goals in as well. So I like yeah. this one as a draw. I think that, you know, trying to, trying to get edgy and pick an upset, this is a place where I can kind of see it happening. Yeah. And yeah. a draw being now- an upset, I guess. Udinese, Verona. Wow. So Udinese have yet to win at home. Okay. The one game that they did get a victory in was away from home. You've got Verona that has lost five of their last six away, failing to score in four of their last five games. This is uh, a tough pick because of the nasty, nasty numbers behind it for both sides. But uh, I'm actually going to say that uh, Udinese does pull this one off and get the win. So I'm going with Udinese. I think uh, Pereira will probably have himself a game and lead them to the victory here at home. Yeah, I, I like what Hellas did last week. As I just said, I, I think they're they're trending a little bit up and I can't consciously pick Udinese until I see them win a game. So I'm going to go with a draw as well in this one. All one, right. one, two, two. I'm sort so of a now scoring we, draw. Now we got a split here. Now we had to. Play. I was I was really gonna pick Udinese too, but once you <laughs> said it, I had to deviate. There you go, Fiorentina Salernitana. Fiorentina has lost uh, four of their last five and only two goals during that stretch. Again, going back to uh, the Italiano hype and uh, Italiano ball and modern football, this etc. Well, everybody's really quiet about that. And I'm just going to keep saying it. Max Allegri's getting results, but uh, he's getting a lot of noise in the wrong direction. But here's Italiano, and his ball ain't working, and it's crickets out there. Let's go. Let's keep it level, everybody. Come on. But Salernitana, well, man, the last time they've won two straight, okay? Here's a little fun fact. Last time they've won two straight was October of 2022, and one of those wins was also against Lazio, who they just defeated last week. Well. And do they make it two wins in a row with Fiorentina away from home? Fiorentina coming off uh, their Conference League uh, victory to Gink there. I am going to say no, it won't happen for Salernitana. I'm picking Fiorentina to get the win at home. I agree. Bounce back game. Uh, you know they're not losing five out of six. I, I think they're not dropping points in in all those games. No, no, they have one win in between. But now I think Fiorentina get it right in this game. Yeah. I'm picking them. There you go. We're on the same queue there. And now we've got Torino hosting Atalanta. Oh man, Torino, Torino. Eight points in their last eight games. Five goals. During that stretch, Atalanta, two losses and a draw in their last three. Um, the last time I think that they've uh, lost three consecutive was uh, February, between February and March, actually, earlier this year in 2023. But this one, uh, I don't see Atalanta slipping up even away from home. Uh, Torino's. Those numbers are ugly, ugly over the last eight games. I think it's going to continue for them. But I will say 
with how Jekyll and Hyde Atalanta is, I wouldn't be surprised with a draw here. Okay. Uh, because they're away from home and they played in Europe and whatnot. Uh, but I'm going to say that Atalanta finds the win here. I'm going to find the find the win. Well, you know what? Yeah. I haven't called a draw. Screw it. I'm going draw. There you I go. I got to call like one it. draw. Go on. Draw game. Yeah, I think Torino's defense hasn't been as good as it ha- has been traditionally or the last couple of years anyway, what they're known for. They're giving up over a goal a game. Um, I think Orangiorno has been really good there in the back, so he's been a, a bright spot for them. But you mentioned it. I don't think Atalanta can go four games without a win. That's uncharacteristic even for them. I like Atalanta to get the win in this one. Yeah, there you go. So, Nick, with the win there. And now we get to Lazio and Cagliari. All right. So, one point in the last three league games for Lazio. Worst start in a decade. But Luis Alberto returns. Cagliari... Well, Gallery is one of those cellar dwellers, all right. Uh, Ranieri uh, sp- surviving, just barely, but he's surviving, all right. This one, I really, really would be shocked if Lazio cannot get the W here at home. Uh, big lift there with what happened in Champions League. I know what went down last week, but it's always different when you're at home. Um, right. I think they can build off that. Luis Alberto returning is a big boost. Uh, they need him going there. Uh, Chiro, you know, yeah, he's getting up there in age when everybody is firing, and he has been firing now all of a sudden again. I think it's something that's going to carry through, and I think they come out hard in this one to get these three points. Obviously, that's going to be big for them because it puts them right there on the cusp of those European spots. Obviously, depending on other results outside of that, but I cannot see Lazio not getting the victory in this one. I've got them winning. Yeah, crazier things have happened, dude. But it's it's a must win. Like, yeah, it, it just is. Uh, I think you hit the nail on the head as well. They're at home. They have to react from last week's disaster. They have to build on what they did in the Champions League. They didn't have to travel for the Champions League. That's also huge, right? Yeah. Uh, not that Cagliari would have had to anyway, but um, you know, you see a lot of these teams have to go all around Europe. That's tough. They didn't have to deal with that, even though it will be a game on short rest. I, I can't see a scenario where we don't put two goals in past Cagliari, even with how bad the offense has been. I, I think Lazio gets the win. Yeah, Lazio for the win. Now we get to Sassuolo and Roma. Sassuolo failing to win eight of their last 10 games at home. Roma, well, one win in their last 10 on the road, okay? Not scoring uh, in the last two of them. Um, man, I think uh, February of 2021 is the last time that they have not scored on the road in three straight. So I can't see it happening with the way Sassuolo concedes. Uh, so expect goals, probably yes. goals from both teams. But I yes. do think that ultimately, uh, even while I think Roma is a little bit of a softer roster, it's definitely got more quality than Sassuolo, and I think that overcomes yeah. here. And I think uh, Lukaku, Dybala back. Uh, I think they're going to have a field day with the back line of uh, Sassuolo's, mm-hmm. and I'd say uh, a good victory for Roma in this one. Yeah, listen, my... Yeah heart my head everything is telling me roma get it done right we we talked at length about how poor i think sassuolo's defense is but i'm gonna go with the upset here i think this is that crazy one game where you get the sassuolo that can be and yeah. they they pull that big three goal four goal performance they get it out of nowhere berardi comes and does something pina monti's been okay the guy that's really disappointed me for them is Loriante. I think he's been really, really average after having a great year last year. Um, I think for our predictions, I have to deviate from you at some point. We have to do something yeah, to, yeah. to separate ourselves here. This is going to be like the classic Roma letdown. Sassuolo did everything right. They win the game. Nobody saw it coming. All right. 
You're taking Sassuolo. I'm going to stick with uh, Roma there. Now we get to uh, the main event of the weekend. Obviously, I'm hoping uh, my lads get the job done and add that pressure, go top of the table heading into this one. But you have Napoli at home at the Meradona hosting Inter. Napoli have only lost one of 17 at home to Inter in the 2000s. All right. Um, and that's in league play, by the way. League play, okay? So yep. Serie A matches. Um, Matsari show will continue and whatnot. I like what he's doing as far as the ball goes and just keeping it... keep Try to keep them comfortable and going back to what they were doing last season. I don't think this is going to be uh, an easy one for either side. I think this is going to be a very entertaining game. Napoli set up much, much different than... Uh, Juventus and how they can mirror each other when they face uh, Inter. That is not going to be the case here. And Napoli uh, has the tools to exploit Inter on counters and whatnot. Will they be able to control a fair amount? Um, because their midfield, I think, I think Napoli's midfield overachieves in terms of how they play. Yeah. But I think Inter's is... It is quality. It is quality. This is going to be a very, very interesting game, but uh, I definitely am taking both teams to score. I know Inter's defensive record is solid, but I say both teams get on the score sheet. I would not be surprised if this, if this game is decided late and maybe yep. also controversially, but uh, man, I honestly think that... Uh, this could be a very, very pivotal game for the entire race because I think Napoli is actually going to beat Inter. Ooh. And I think that could spark uh, that crazy, crazy run from Napoli that puts them definitely right back in the thick of things and the fight. So I'm going to take Napoli in like a 2-1 victory over Inter. Okay. I like it. I I would like to go on record to say that would be the most fun result that could happen. I think it would be great for the league. Um, obviously, I, I know you feel that way for Juve, but I, I think that puts this top four back into complete chaos. And as a fan of a team that I know can't win the league, that you know that's what I want. But I do think. Inter have been preparing for this game for some time. We, you know, we mentioned they mailed in the Champions League this yeah. week. They were 100% focused on this game. Uh, I, I felt even more so when they went down early to uh, Benfica. I was like, oh, yeah, like this is a no doubt put the mortgage on Inter this weekend because this is this is exactly how it's supposed to play out. Um, I do feel a little bit better about Napoli, as you said, with that. The way they played away to Real Madrid, I, I think they put in a better showing than the scoreline suggested. Exactly. So you do have to give them credit for that. Um, but I, I think in all the positions where it counts, I, I think Sommer has been fantastic. Maybe the goalkeeper of the season so far. Uh, Medet has not been. So could something come down to those two players? Possibly. Lotaro and Osimen, if they're both playing and both healthy, you know, Maybe a slight edge to Lotaro just on the form he's on, but pretty much a toss up. Um, so, who has the better supporting cast? And I, I think we can agree it's Inter. We think Inter is, is um, a little more well oiled, more drilled at this point. You know, we, we said everything there is to say. And I think if they win this game, that takes Napoli out of title contention completely. So, you know, they're going to be going 100%. And if they can do that, that's kind of what happens there for me. So I'm going to go with Inter. Yeah, it's uh, it's going to be – it could go so many different ways. I just – yeah, my gut is telling me even in losses, you can gain – Sometimes, and I feel like Napoli gained based on how they approached the fair. match at the Bernabeu Very and fair. how it went. And I again going back to Inzaghi. Inzaghi's got quality on his at his disposal, but he is pragmatic. He is pragmatic, and uh, this could be one of those games. I don't think Inter's gonna you know 
blow the roof off the joint by any means. And uh, they will be weary, and he will have his team weary of the potential damage Napoli can cause offensively. It's going to be one of those chess matches, but who do you back in a chess match? And when I start thinking about Mazzari against Inzaghi, I know who I'm going to pick, but, but this is a huge one for Napoli. And amidst everything that went down this season, this could be one of those moments that flips the switch on the entire season. So, yeah, I just, I just think it's going to be one hell of a game. And, uh, yeah, I want them to, uh, I want them to get the job done. Well, I'm always happy seeing Inter lose. Everybody knows that. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, leave us at uh, top of the table on one point uh, going out of this weekend because then we have Napoli. And so while I do want them to get it, I kind of don't so that they, uh, you know, don't uh, have that big boost yeah, last uh, thing with you that need game is coming yeah, up. Yeah. So things are heating up and getting interesting around Serie A. But that wraps up the uh, predictions. That wraps up the show. It's going to be a wild one this weekend. It's always a wild one. And Serie A, you just never know what is going to go on. But this race, the top four can see a lot of changes uh, happening. And, uh, my God, you got to keep eyes on uh, Bologna being three points out away from uh, Napoli. Uh, Roma's on 21 points. Things are going to get very, very tight. And all eyes are going to be on what happens with Inter and Napoli. For me... Just don't slip on that banana peel tomorrow, Juve, and I'm happy, all right? Your ta- your table, again, Inter in first, Juve second, Milan third, Napoli. You have Roma, Bologna, Atalanta, Fiorentina, Monza, Frosinone, rounding out your top ten. Capo Cagnanere, obviously everyone knows the form Lotaro has been in is massive. He's on 13 goals. Then you have Berardi and Giroud at seven. Colpani on six with Sule. On six goals, obviously, Nicolas Gonzalez of Fiorentina and Lukaku on six. Osiman, who's been out with injury, still sitting on six. He was off to a flying start. And Marcus Taram, the partnership he's got there, he's league leader for assists on six. I'm going to ask you a question there with Lotaro. Do you think he breaks the record or ties the record this season? That's tough to say uh, because it, it, so many things can go wrong for it not to happen, right? You you miss one or two games through a knock. Um, you have a cold patch of, you know, maybe three games without a goal, right? So it's so much harder to do it versus not do it. But I will say at the beginning of the year, the one prediction that seems to be standing up so far is I said we haven't seen the best of Lotaro yet. I think we really haven't scratched the surface of how good this guy can be. I didn't know Turam was going to be the guy to unlock it, but that seems to be the case so far. So um, I, I think he gets very close to 30 goals. Uh, I definitely do. Yeah, it's it, going to be uh, one hell of uh, a race of watch. He's running away with it right now, so everybody's just kind of thinking, man, can he actually do it? <laughs> We will see. You guys know what I'm hoping for, all right? Hey, I got to be a Juve fan at the end of the day. It is what it is. But, Nick, I got to say thank you, everybody, again. Check out Kicks and Picks podcast where you'll find Nick and the lads. They do a great, great job. It's a lot of fun. I enjoy it. Obviously, uh, the gambling spin on it and uh, betting and whatnot always adds a little mix there. But, of course, do so responsibly if you're going to do it. Or just don't do it at all and just... uh, Do it for fun and just keep track of yourself and what you're doing if you're getting them right. Um, There's a lot of fun in that too. But I'm going to let you uh, plug yourself one more time as we wrap things up, Nick. No, I was just going to say last thing you want is the Serbians at your front door coming to collect. So be responsible. uh, Have some fun. Appreciate you for having me on, Alberto. It's been a a pleasure, dude. Always always enjoy your stuff, whether it's with uh, all Juve cast or now this great new show that you have. So uh, definitely appreciate you having me here. As you mentioned, at Kicks Picks Pod, my personal Twitter at Nick Diani. Love to interact, banter. We we've had a lot of fun for some time, so uh, definitely some appreciate banner. you having me We always me on. got some banner. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Twitter's great for that. And yes, I still call it Twitter. All right, uh, not getting Absolutely. down with the next thing. All right, I so. haven't even up. I haven't even up, uh, up updated the the logo yet. It's still Twitter on my phone. Oh man, mine did yeah. automatically, and it drives me nuts. Wish I could won't go let back. it. Wish I could go back. But everybody, this wraps up uh, your Calcio review going into uh, Match Week 14. Again, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you next week, same time, 
same channel, and then we'll see how good our picks went. And of course, take a look at the next round of action, all right? As always, take care, everybody. Ciao.